mushroom eaters. Okay. So, I have decided to term this game Psychedelic Candyland. And by that, I don't mean to denigrate it with uh, what Candyland, you know, they. Hey, I don't have any decision making at all. I'm just picking a card and moving my piece. It's not like that at all. But the reason is because you have basically uh, a linear board and you're moving oh, a linear board that like folds and unfolds as you're playing with it. But you have a linear path um, of things that happen and you're just moving uh, by a number card. Okay, that's not Candyland. Candyland, you move to the color that you're going to next and you're trying to get the distance. But it's sort of, you know, if you mix numbers and types of spaces and switch them around, you'd end up with that if you had no choice. But here's the thing. So, this is not a game without strategy. Uh, that's the first thing to say about it. If you, Actually, the strategic side of it reminds me a great deal of much more modern games uh, in terms of uh, in terms of the levels of options that you have and the amount of you know move versus counter move all kind of judgments there. So here's what's going on: you have cards that you have a hand of cards with numbers on them and they tell you how far you can move and when you run out of your hand you pick it back up and you have it all over again okay so there are spaces that have different effects but generally there are effects that everybody shares <laughs> but some few of them give you a particular bonus on your own and you have choices on the ones that give you benefits and some of them that give you penalties as to well, many of them that give you penalties as to what your benefits and penalties are so you can kind of tailor what you're set up to deal with and be better than other people at it and then use your number cards to try to get to the spaces that work for you and it's this whole mass of tangled mess of different options that are all intertwining and conflicting with each other and helping one each one another and, and this that and the other and some of some of the uh, actions you know you can kind of work together to cause something to happen because you have shared interests however my suspicion is that most of the midterm planning We've got some big long-term planning that I didn't do a damn thing about because I don't know the board yet, uh, and the board's not in front of you. It changes and mutates as you're playing, but always in a fixed pattern. It would be really cool if it, didn't, if it wasn't a fixed board. It's not entirely fixed because there are some spaces, these spaces, that you don't know what they are. They could be anything. That's a very limited amount of the board. If the whole board kind of mutated and like, <laughs> wow, that would that that would take this beyond uh, uh, that 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 would make this so that it would always be sort of the same experience every time you you face it. It would always be so new to you. This uh, entering into the spirit realm would be completely a different thing each time. But in this case, you in the case of the game as it's designed, you can kind of learn the board, you learn the pattern of the paths, and it will largely follow that. Um, so you can make long-term strategy based on what you know the board is going to be. I don't know if that's the best way to play, but that's okay. The midterm strategy though, where you're trying to figure out, hey, what's that guy going to do next, and if I do this, what happens? I'm not even sure what to relate it to. Um, so, there's two options, and I can't figure out which one is which, which one is correct. Of course, I only played it once. One option is 
this is a really, really deep game. And, you know, there's a lot you can do within that kind of mixed uh, spaghetti pile of interactive goals and, and, and desires. Um, and the other is that that pile is just too complex to really pull a thread out that makes sense and that the conflicting desires more or less cancel out and there isn't that much depth. That whatever you choose to do, your opponent is going to be able to counter it if it's over the midterm. In a short-term situation, you can have them, you know, they're nuts in a vice, essentially, in this game. And you can really do a lot of damage to them. But getting yourself into a position where you can enforce that you're going to be able to do that to someone, I don't think there's anything... I, I, I really suspect that it's not there. And that's fair. I think there are a lot of Euros out there that if people are making reasonable choices uh, that aren't just following a linear path like this, that it's that big spaghetti mess and you pull on one piece and that opens up a, a little place where they can stick their noodle through somewhere else or whatever you want to call this um so i think actually it's kind of on par with a lot of uh attempts that have been recent that i've seen you know just some of the worker placement type stuff well if i play here that means now you have different options than if i play here and uh there's an abstract game under it all that is not easy to figure out, and I've even played games with a traditional card game, uh, I'm trying to remember, Brioche, that was just to that point where it was so complex that you could kind of look at it and say, you know, it stops really being um, that much a strategy game anymore. So even though every action is known in this, and everything's in front of you until the board unfolds. But if you know the board, everything's in front of you. It still may be just too much to figure it all out, to put it all together. And the truth may be, whatever you do to try to make your life better in the long run is going to open something up that your opponent can kind of squeeze through and neutralize it out. And I'll tell you, go, the, the best game ever, right? kind of has that. You place a piece somewhere, you're making a defined term, uh, uh, carving out some territory in one direction, your opponent now has an opportunity in another direction that, you that he wouldn't have had had you not made that play. So, I don't know, you know, maybe there's still that depth there, and <laughs> um, it's just harder for me to see because there's not this geometric re representation that works for me. The mathematics of the game is beyond my ability to visualize. That all said, I don't think that's why anybody plays this game. I don't think that's why anybody falls in love with it. I think what is really, really the driving focus of this game is an experiential um, reflection. And... You wouldn't have these otherwise, right? You wouldn't have the artwork that you have. It's to put you in a mood, and the fact that the board folds uh, out and, and changes and morphs as you're playing um, is all kind of leading you to that experience. The artwork really, you know, I don't know how they do it. I really don't. They do these tiny little print runs, but they seem to have such talented uh, and focused on, on a specific uh, mood that the artists pre present uh, from uh, Blast City. And, you know, the original copy of this was, what, 50? 50 issues? And that's another thing that's shocking. The amount of, uh, the type of game that it is, is very odd for 1998, which is, I guess, when it first came out. Anyway, the recent run um, gives you an opportunity to get this kind of, it's still only 500 copies, but to get what is really, you know, was an absolute rarity, 
into into your collection and that's probably a part of it is the collector aspect the artistic aspect of it and the experiential game but there is what looks like a pretty solid game under there too and at the worst if it isn't if there isn't that midterm uh, level uh, of really being able um, it, to formulate plans that kind of work in the way that you'd want them to. Uh, it's going to take you a, while, a few plays to get to the point where that's not there. And there is, there are definitely some long-term strategic choices. For example, uh, simple one, do you want to go for Paradox? There's a big bonus if you win the Paradox. Do you want to go for the Personal Paths? There's a big bonus if you win that fight. If somebody, if nobody's going for them, you might be able to get one of those kind of easily. So there's kind of the, uh, you don't want to go all out on it if no one's going for it. If, you, but you might want to go all out on some of the other things, like if you can try to manage wisdom. Although that, I didn't see any opportunities to particularly do any long-term things to make sure you get the maximum wisdom. There are long-term things you can do though to get the face. Uh, those are three points each. That's a big, big pile of points in the game. Um, so yeah, uh, I think there's a game that would appeal to another type of gamer than me. And there's an experiential game here that probably appeals to a different type of person than me better. And they mix together? Well, you know, I read Michael Barnes's uh, review of it, which tries to make the game seem like it meshes perfectly in, like the, the mathematical game, meshes perfectly in with uh, the artwork and everything else, and just to blow your mind. And I, I have to tell you, the game doesn't. The game does not blow my mind. <laughs> It leaves me with the, it may be too complicated to figure out, or it may not be, and that's a position that I've seen in a number of games. And, you know, uh, you probably don't want it to not be too complicated, actually, if you're trying to design the perfect game, because Go is one of those games where there is no, you, there's things you can do that you can optimize, but generally, if you get the the tactical aspect down in Go, then the strategic thinking is more in terms of recognizing where there's a little bit of room for you. Now, in a multiplayer situation, that becomes a little bit different. So, anyway. Um, it doesn't fit my type of game. And for a game that's going to be that kind of depth, I would prefer to play Go, right? Because it's simpler, I'm not gonna get the headache, I'm not gonna have to try to figure out the rules. The rules themselves are almost this kind of, uh, without really trying to be, but through a certain, the presentation, and maybe my expectations from the game, felt almost like the same kind of wading through a, a, a a trip trying to make, waiting, waiting through your dreams, trying to make some kind of sense out of it all and make a reality uh, and, and pull something together that didn't really make sense. And then once you start playing it, well, you find it. But for me, maybe the problem there is the rules are actually procedural and I always have trouble with procedural rules. <laughs> you know? So uh, it tells me, here's this, and here's what you do here, and it doesn't really link it together. But in a sense, there's nothing to link together because this is uh, this journey that like isn't in a realm that you can really uh, call concrete in any way, right? It's a dream, uh, essentially. It's a hallucination, and. 
uh, for me, maybe the fact that it's procedural rules and kind of an abstract game kind of throws that all into I'm just in that receptive mood for that in, a, in an automatic way. I don't know. Um, but there is a certain headache aspect to trying to comprehend the board. The paths sometimes aren't as clear as they might be. Some of the cards are hard to read. They get a lot harder if you put these suckers on, at least for me. Um, you can only face the board in one direction, really. It doesn't work from the side, supposedly, but it just kind of glows is what happens. And, you know, I, I actually don't get much difference no matter what I turn it from. It just sort of glows. There's a little bit of boinging out of the glow if you have it facing the right way. Um, anyway, I think it's really cool that Nate's willing to share these with me and let me take a look at them. Um, uh, this is something that with the right group I could definitely see playing. I doubt that I'm going to do it solo much, but my wife probably is interested in it. She loves the artwork in these games. And that's part of that experiential thing. I mean, it's like, it's trying to hit you on so many different levels, right? It's trying to hit you with the artwork, it's trying, and, and, and the mood, and I think it succeeds very well there, and I, I, I think everything that, that I've seen of theirs does. It's trying to hit you with a good game, and in this case, it's of a good kind of Euro-type game. Even though it's the singular path, uh, with a lot of similarities to Candyland. <laughs> Except that the, uh, the candy is going to make you feel ill. Um, <laughs> which can only be better. Uh, yeah. And so you have the good game, you have the artistic side and the mood, and you have something else that I can't quite put my finger on it's trying to do. Um, now Nate says that it really is trying to give some sort of feel for that shamanism. I'm not catching that at all. I'm just not. Uh, I, I don't I don't feel like I'm getting anything other than um, the the blur that I don't think I the cards in here that are referring to the earpieces. Um, the blur part I get, and I get the trying to figure out how to get to where I'm going ah, theme of it, right? Uh, but I don't feel like and maybe because I'm strategizing and trying to win this competitive game at the same time, I don't feel like I'm on a path to be a shaman when I'm playing it. Uh, not in the same way, you know, in the same way that I, 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 I don't necessarily feel with most Euros that I'm in the role that I'm playing. I feel like I'm playing a game still.